It's been the heart of Donald Trump's defense since the start of the impeachment investigation. No quid pro quo, no wrongdoing. But even as his lawyers make their defense before the Senate, new details leak from a manuscript written by former National Security Advisor John Bolton undercutting the president's arguments. According to the New York Times, which obtained parts of the unpublished book, President Trump told Bolton in August that he wanted to continue freezing $391 million in security assistance to Ukraine until officials there helped with investigations into Democrats, including the Bidens. The president, of course, denied the report on Twitter, writing, I never told John Bolton that the aid to Ukraine was tied to investigation into Democrats, including the Bidens. If John Bolton said this, it was only to sell a book. So, will this crack the partisan divide in the Senate? Yeah, I think it's important to uh, be able to hear uh, from John Bolton for us to be able to make an impartial judgment. I think it's uh, increasingly likely uh, that other Republicans will, uh, will join those of us who think we should hear from John Bolton. As a reminder, at least four Republicans would have to join Democrats to allow any witness testimony. But does it matter? Just 8% of general election voters say impeachment is the most important issue in deciding who they'll vote for in November, according to a new Emerson College poll. Far fewer than the 37% who said the economy was the biggest factor in their decision, the 16% who picked health care, and 13% who said social issues. Those are some of the issues at the core of the new book, Tightrope, Americans Reaching for Hope. The Pulitzer Prize winning author is New York Times columnist Nicholas Kristof, former New York Times reporter Cheryl Wu Dunn. Join me now. Congratulations. Great to see you both. Thank you, you, So, Cheryl, you told us on the radio today you're both hopeful people. So are you hopeful that some of the 53 Republicans will break ranks and put loyalty to country ahead of loyalty? Well, he's nodding yes. I want to hear from you <laughs> first. Loyalty to country before loyalty to Donald Trump? Well, it depends on which vote you're talking about. Well, let's say you said the witness test. So the there's witness, a fair trial. Yeah, I think that there's a good shot there on when it comes to the actual impeachment vote? I'm not sure. Why are you nodding so passionately? I think that the Bolton breakthrough, that that really has put some of the Republicans who will face voters in a difficult position. And I, I think that may indeed turn the tide in a, in a way that, I mean, yesterday I thought that was not going to happen. Today I think it will. From your lips, as they say. Let's get to the book. You uh, tell stories so powerfully and beautifully of so many people. You rode the number six school bus uh, with in Yamhill, Oregon. Uh, who fell through the cracks and worse, Clayton and Kevin Green, Mary Mayer, the five kids in the Knapp family. Four of those five kids did not make it. Why, why didn't they make it, Nick? They struggled in the job market, um, and then they self-medicated with drugs, with alcohol. Uh, Farlin, the oldest, died as a consequence of drugs from liver failure. Zeeland um, died in a house fire when he was passed out drunk. His uh, sister, Rogina, died of hepatitis, uh, and um, then Nathan blew himself up making meth. And Why'd the fifth survive? Because he was in prison for 13 years in the Oregon State Penitentiary. That saved his life. And you know, Cheryl, we are conditioned, when we hear about people like that, we're conditioned, many of us are conditioned, I shouldn't say everybody, to say, well, they obviously made some horrible choices. I feel bad for the family, but they made horrible uh, choices. Uh, uh, you don't buy that notion, but sadly, some of the people who have been victimized do buy it. They sort of stigmatize themselves, as I think what you describe in the book, yes? A absolutely. There are two reasons why I don't buy it. One is, uh, first of all, that people do uh, sort of um, internalize a lot of the things that they're taught by society. And so we can change that narrative. Why is it important to change that narrative? For two reasons. One is, there is a sense that all this injustice uh, is, is pretty offensive in a country that's built on the principle of justice. And so we do need to lend a helping hand rather than pointing fingers. Uh, the second thing I would say is really important for competitiveness of the U.S. Right now, uh, we like to call ourselves number one in everything. But in fact, we're, we're number 44 in access to clean drinking water, which all of us take for granted. We're actually number 25 on the Social Progress in Index in terms of our overall ranking of 143 countries. So if we want to be competitive and get back to number one, we but that it. self, uh, you know, caring about our neighbors things it almost feels like so yesterday. I mean, I'm serious. I, I don't mean that as crassly as it sounds, but that's sort of how we were yesterday in America, not how we are today. But at the end of the day, we have to invest in our own people. 
And the reason the economy worked so well in the 19, in the, after the World War II period, in the 1950s, 1960s, was we invested in physical infrastructure, like interstate highways, and we invested in human infrastructure, like colleges and universities, community colleges, libraries. And if, you know, America can't live up to its potential if Americans aren't living up to theirs. I, you would win that argument. I think the jury would come back in about a nanosecond and <clears> say, uh, whatever it is, we find for the plaintiff or whatever you are. But the American people, at least a, a huge swath of them, don't buy that. You talk yeah. about your seventh grade crush. Uh, Mary Mayer is her name, right? That's right. Who fell on hard times. She did come through for a variety of reasons. But you tell the story. She voted. She didn't vote much. She voted for Donald Trump. She still thinks he's doing a good job. In fact, I think you said she abandoned Taylor Swift because she, she had the temerity to say she, that she liked a couple of Democrats, right? So she yeah. doesn't get it. She, she doesn't. But I think that things may be changing. You know, in the last 50 years, we've basically been cutting taxes and cutting investments in human capital. That kind of came to an apex in Kansas under Governor Sam Brownback. Mm -hmm. Then Kansas voters rebelled because their schools were suffering too much. They raised taxes. I wonder if that won't be seen as a turning point in America. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because, and there was a Republican legislature that did that. Yeah. Was that I mean, not that's true? a red state Republican yeah. uh, legislature. You, you talk, I am, you know, what's a great line from uh, Lily Tomlin? No matter how cynical I get, I can't keep up. That's sort of how I feel <laughs> about myself from time to time. But you guys do talk a lot about solutions in the book, both what individuals individuals can do, what nonprofits can do, but the cornerstone has got to be an activist government. But for those of us who believe we have been moving away from that notion for the past 50 years, you talked today about states being, I think, was it Brandeis called them, laboratories of democracy kind of thing. That's the ticket for now, yes? We are seeing states take more control over some of these issues. Um, in Rhode Island, for instance, we were just talking to the governor there, and she's focusing on retraining for jobs. She knows that the manufacturing you know, base that they have in Rhode Island, which was one of the largest in the country, needs to actually have retraining for the future of work. And that's really important. There are obviously other issues related to, you know, Rhode Island, and that's true of other states as well. But in Illinois now, they're giving an amnesty uh, to people who had suspended driver's license because, you know, they couldn't pay the fines. There are small, lots of little pockets of cruelty uh, that really need to be reversed. And do you believe that'll trickle up? I mean, is that is that the goal uh, ultimately, or that the belief that if states well, do things well and they save money for taxpayers in many cases, that it trickles up to the feds or no? I think that models can be proved. So, for example, drug treatment. You know, it should be a scandal in America that only one in ten Americans with a dependency issue gets treatment, mm -hmm. even though treatment pays for itself many times over. You do see a little more compassion now that it's white. Uh, voters who are struggling with these issues in a way that did not exist when it was more African-American communities. And so some red states are making some progress on these issues. But I guess at the end of the day, we didn't build an interstate highway system with the volunteers and philanthropy. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to build drug treatment, early childhood education with volunteers and philanthropy. You know, I've read most of what you both have written. And one of the takeaways for me with this book, I felt much more pained by these stories than the other ones you told. And I concluded, I thought a lot about this, is it's one thing I like reading about like. I am more comfortable reading about misery in other parts of the world because I subliminally say there's probably not much I can do about that. This is almost a challenge, I felt, which is why... I. You know what I mean? I, that I felt it much more immediately because these things we can do something about. Their yam hill is all around us, right? And I mean, a lot of the reaction to tightrope has been, "Oh, this is gut wrenching." But. What is most gut-wrenching is not the problems, but that we have toolboxes, that we can solve these problems. We have proven toolboxes. Other countries are dealing with automation, globalization, and they don't have falling life expectancy the way we do. And so what I find saddest is not the problems in and of themselves, but the fact that we are sitting by and doing nothing to address them. And, and that's in part because we've reached a time when facts don't matter very much. I mean, is that not, I mean, I think, the, I said this the other day, I think the much more powerful part of your story is not the incredibly, uh, uh, the, the, fa the data that can't be uh, contradicted, but the human beings. I, every story you tell, you could see somebody, one could see somebody they know who was not unlike Mary Mayer or the Greens yeah. or the Naps, or, you well, know? And that's why we actually had to have a blend, because we know that storytelling is really important to reach out Everything. to people. Uh, we also know that they need to have facts to support it, and so we think the combination is really important, just in the same way that we think that in order to attack these problems, there's no one solution. 
It's lots of little things from lots of different places. How hard is it to see these people who you knew as little kids sitting on a bus with you in either not surviving or surviving in the toughest circle? You guys lead a pretty good life. I mean, how hard is it? It's very hard, and it's, it's very strange to go from New York back to Yamhill and see the kid who was in the home closest to me growing up, who used to walk to the school bus with every morning, who's now homeless, Mike Stepp. But How somebody, do you even deal with that? I mean, you know, somebody on, on I, I Instagrammed a picture of me and Mike together, and somebody said, you know, that must be pretty hard on you to go back and see Mike. And I said, well, you know, if you think it's hard on me, think about how Mike feels about that and how Mike's family feels about it. And Mike's brother is serving a life sentence in prison right now. And these are kids who, you know, they were looking forward to a better future. Their dad had come up from nothing, was a Korean War hero. There was nothing about Mike and Bobby that well, they weren't less smart than their dad. They weren't less diligent. But jobs disappeared, and they made mistakes, but so did we as a society. And when we just talk about their personal responsibility, we don't talk about our social responsibility, something is missing from the discussion. You tell the story beautifully. By the way, I should say, while you're collaborators, I didn't mention you're also yeah. married. Are you the first married couple to win a Pulitzer Prize for journalism? Are you? Exactly. You are? We are. Look at the smiles on their faces. The book is spectacular. <laughs> it's must read. It's so good to see you again. Thank Show. you so Thanks much, so much. Thanks And you so as much, well, Christoph. Really appreciate it. The book again is Tightrope Americans Reaching for Hope.